Bonjour, bonjour. It is March 24th of 2021, and we're looking at the resurgence of conservatism. Let's see how long my light stays on, because the battery's low. And if we get in the dark, we get in the dark. All right, Ronald Reagan, number 40. We're up to number 40 already. Look at that. So a little bit about Reagan. He was the president of the Screen Actors Guild over there in Hollywood. He was like 40 movies. You know, I put up there that he was in mostly westerns, but then I started doing a little bit of research, and I don't think that's actually accurate. I think, I mean, he had some westerns. He had some war films. He had those cute little buddy-buddy uh, romantic comedies, and probably, <laughs> probably his most famous film was actually called Bedtime for Bonzo, where he, where he was a... Uh, uh, he, his character was that he was a psychologist, and he hired a lady to, to be... Uh, the mother of this chimpanzee, and he played the father of this chimpanzee, and they tried to raise the chimpanzee as a normal person to see nature versus nurture and all that kind of crazy stuff. So, I wonder if I, if I had a classroom full of chimpanzees, if I'd had more people turn in their work. <laughs> uh, you can have an infinite amount of chimpanzees with an infinite amount of typewriters, and they will... Do you get that reference? I wonder if you do. Let's see, so he's a lifelong Democrat, and in the 1960s, he changed over to Republican, and interestingly enough, if you were to, if you were to ask the Republicans um, who is the greatest president of all time, well, depending if they're, if they're you know, Trump or Reagan, they're definitely in the top two, uh, so, but this guy, big, big uh, Republican. Governor of California, 67 to 75, won in a landslide in the 1980 election. Oh, oh, he was elected in a zero year, here we go. Uh, he blew Carter away in the 1980 election, and so who is Reagan? He's a neoconservative, and so what are his values? Let's see. Opposed big government, supported the common man rights, opposed favoritism for minorities, supported free market capitalism, supremely, <laughs> supremely anti-Soviet, opposed liberal welfare programs and affirmative action, and called for traditional values. So we're going to look at each one of those, I think. I'll go from there. All right, so... The Reagan Revolution. Now, as you recall, the last time we were, uh, I was talking, we had a, uh, we had the I Iranian hostage crisis going on with Jimmy Carter, and we had the uh, we had the Americans who were held over there in Iran for 444 days. And remember, the last thing I said on that video was that uh, then Reagan became president, and like three minutes later, the hostages were released. And so he's going to start off on a high note here. So there you go. Uh, Reagan's major goal. His major goal was to reduce the size of government and then uh, shrink the budget and to cut taxes. That was the game plan. That was the game plan. We're going to talk about each of those in a second. Reagan proposed a new budget that called for uh, cuts of $35 billion. And again, I know we're talking with, with numbers like B, billion with a B, not trillion with a T. Because it's still in the 80s, and we're still thinking small, <laughs> small potatoes. 35 billion. That's that's funny. Uh, 35 billion, mostly in social programs like food stamps and federally funded job training centers. So he's going to cut food stamp things. Yeah, that's not a very popular thing. Thinking about that today, is that? And everything was going great, and everything's going wonderful. Let's see. He was elected. He became president in January. Then on March, I think it was March 30th. Do I have that? He was shot. Oh, Tippecanoe, right? The curse of Tippecanoe. President Reagan is shot. So here's what's going on. He was he had a speech uh, in Washington D.C. at, at uh, one of the downtown hotel, one of the Washington D.C. hotels, and he was told, you know, you should wear your wear your bulletproof vest, and the Secret Service people wear your bulletproof vest. But they're like, no, because this hotel is safe. And between the back doors of the hotel to the limousine, the presidential car, um, it was only 30 feet, like nine meters. That was all it was. And so you don't need to wear your bulletproof vest for nine meters, right? I mean, please. Well, he should have. John Hinckley Jr., the uh, the uh, the guy who who, uh, who had the gun. Uh, he he's going to go after Reagan. Now it's kind of interesting. He decided he was going to kill Carter, uh, and he actually got within one foot of Carter uh, just to see if he could do it. But then he didn't kill Carter, and he waited around for Reagan. And why is he going to try to kill a president? Well, this uh, a wannabe assassin. Uh, he's trying to impress a movie star, uh, Jodie Foster. You may know her from uh, Silence of the Lambs. Have you got have you seen Silence of the Lambs? Um, but anyway, Jodie Foster. And so he was, 
he was a stalker of her. In fact, he, he stalked her everywhere and wrote her notes and enrolled in the same college and all, all crazy stuff. But he thought she's such a big movie star that if he becomes famous, then the two of them would then be equal and then she would go out with him. And uh, it turns out that's not how that works. And so he uh, stood there as Reagan was approaching him. And you see the group of guys, this, this picture was taken just seconds before the assassination attempt, um, as Reagan as Reagan walks by, uh, Hinkley Jr., John Hinkley Jr., uh, a a member of the press shouts out to Reagan, "Hey, uh, tell me what you think about X Y Z." And Hinkley Jr. pulls out his gun and fires six shots in about a second and a half. Bang, 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 bang. Um, the first shot hits uh, Mr. Brady here. Uh, and uh, Secretary of State, no, Secretary of Defense, Secretary. Anyway, hits one of uh, Reagan's aides, one of his cabinet members. He hits a Secret Service member. He hits uh, he hits another guy uh, with a gun, but he doesn't hit Reagan directly. Uh, as Reagan, as one of the Secret Service guys, basically pushes Reagan down into the limousine because uh, the door's open. Uh, one of the last shots of the gun. The bullet bounced off the door and hit Reagan under the left, uh, under his arm, his left arm, and it careened off a rib and went into his lung and stopped about one inch from his heart. Reagan didn't realize he was shot. He thought that, uh, because he was basically pushed into the limousine, he thought that he had bumped himself against the car door, and uh, and so he didn't he didn't know he was shot. Uh, the assassin, uh, I'm sorry, the wannabe assassin, uh, was jumped on immediately. You see the aftermath here of the assassin. Well, you don't even see the assassin in the picture. He's in that scrum. We have Mr. Brady down. Uh, he's the one lying face down in the blue there. That's going to be important here in a second. Um, but uh, the assassin is captured. Uh, and then he's going to be, uh, so Reagan, Reagan is going to be taken back to the White House. And uh, on the way to the White House, uh, they're asking, are you all right? You're all right? And Reagan's like, yeah, I think, you know, I just bumped myself in the door or whatever. And, and uh, then he coughs and he's coughing up frothy, frothy blood. And they're like, mm, that's not good because that means something happened to your lung. And so they took him to the hospital. And uh, as they go, as they get out of the car, Reagan insists that he's going to walk. Now, he just, he's just been shot. And so he gets up and he walks from the car into the emergency room waving at people like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm the president, I'm cool, everything's good. And then he gets into the emergency room and goes down on one knee. Uh, so then, of course, the doctors swarm on him and they take him back to the operating room. Uh, he's cracking jokes the whole time. Reagan is cracking jokes. This whole, he's just been shot. He's cracking jokes. Uh, they're about to put the oxygen mask on him to knock him out. Or I guess, you know, it wouldn't be oxygen mask. It would be the, the gas mask on him to knock him out. And he's like... Uh, <laughs> He says something to the effect of, I hope all of you voted for Republic. I hope you're all Republicans. You voted for me or something like that. <laughs> and the, and the, the chief surgeon allegedly said something like, uh, today we're all Republicans. Although, ironically, he was actually a Democrat. doesn't matter. Reagan, wa uh, Reagan was in the hospital for 12 days, and 12 days later, he uh, came right out, and he was president. Uh, even though he was in surgery, even though he was in the hospital, they did not relinquish his control of the football the nuclear football. Uh, his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, George Bush number one, um, was there and he kind of kept everything going for 12 days. But Reagan was, Reagan, uh, they didn't have to use the, uh, they didn't have to use the 25th Amendment to uh, uh, remove him from office because he turned out okay, which means this, the curse of Tippecanoe, We've killed presidents in 19, uh, I'm sorry, presidents have died in, in 1840, 1860, 1880, 1900, 1920, 1940, 1960, the, the dates of their uh, inauguration or the, the election. And now we have 1980 and Reagan was shot he, he, in his lung, uh, but uh, he did survive. So the curse is broken. The curse is broken. So all of you who voted for whoever you voted for in uh, 2020, which is a zero. Well, I guess you haven't. You guys didn't get get to vote. Anyway, uh, I guess President Biden doesn't have to worry about it because the curse is now broken. All right. John Hinckley Jr. went to. Uh, he was. He was. Uh, 
he went to a mental hospital instead of jail. He went to a mental hospital. And in fact, uh, there you go. So uh, Mr. Brady, uh, here on the far, so this is President Clinton. So I'm, I'm actually jumping ahead about 11 years here, uh, but just kind of wrapping up this part of the story. President Clinton in the center, and he's signing the Brady bill. And uh, uh, Pre uh, Brady is stage left there in the uh, other tie, in the red tie there. Um, Brady was shot, and it went in through his, uh, right above his left eye and into his brain, and so he had permanent brain damage from there on out. So they, they did the research, and they found out where John Hinckley Jr. got the gun. Well, see, now he had originally been in a mental hospital. His, his uh, parents put him in a mental hospital, and he got out, and then he went and he got a gun. And so President well, the Congress and then ultimately President uh, Clinton, they're going to sign this bill, and they're going to say, okay, there are certain people in our society that do not, should not have guns. And we call this the Brady Bill, named after Mr. Brady. And here's the list. I'll just go through it real fast. The following people are not allowed to have guns. See if you agree with all these. Somebody's been convicted of a crime punishable by one year uh, imprisonment, so anybody who's a felon. Somebody who's a fugitive from justice, meaning they're on the run. Anybody who's addicted to a controlled substance, so drugs. Anybody who's been educated, adjudicated as a mental defective or committed to a mental institution is an illegal alien has been discharged from the service for uh, dishonorable reasons. Somebody who's a United States citizen who has denounced their United States citizenship. Somebody who is a stalker or has been given a court, a court order, you know, a victim restraining order. And number nine, somebody who's been convicted of a misdemeanor of domestic violence. Those people, according to the Brady Bill, should not have a gun. And if they go up to a gun, shop, a gun shop and they want to buy a gun, if this comes up in their background check, and this is where we're going to start our background checks for guns, if it comes up, then they are not allowed to have a gun. Not that you can't get a gun in other places, but they're trying. They're trying to keep guns out of the hands of a certain group of people. We're going to argue about that next, next year in uh, AP government. Second Amendment, right? Here we go. Moving on. Okay, Reagan is going to push supply-side economics. Supply-side economics. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you take the businesses and you reduce their taxes. Okay, so you take, you take the corporations, you take their, ta their taxes away. They now have more money. If they have more money, they have more product because they can put their money into whatever they're making. If there's more product out there, that means price goes down, cause and effect. The more that's out there, the, the lower the price. If the price is less, more people can then uh, buy it, right? And if there's more people buying stuff, that means that you have to have more people making the stuff, which means now there's jobs. If there's more jobs out there, then that helps out everybody. That's, that's trickle-down economics. We've already talked about that way back about eight, eight videos ago with Andrew Carnegie and where Melman, one of those Andrews, and he said, yes, you take the taxes away from the rich, then they will take their money that they would have spent in taxes, and then they'll put it into their stuff, and it will trickle down, and it will help out everybody. Reaganomics, trickle-down economy. According to Reagan, this would stimulate investment, boost productivity, promote dramatic economic growth, and reduce the federal deficit. Make sure next year when you take economics uh, to argue with your economics teacher the pros and cons of trickle-down theory. The problem, uh, and so, uh, and ultimately here in the year 2021, the Republicans support trickle-down and the Democrats uh, support trickle-up. Okay. 
here's the problem here, uh, though. As President Reagan is going to implement this, um, <laughs> we've, already, we've had four years of President Carter, a Democrat, and so the deal is with being president that you have to deal with whoever was president before you and their policies, because their policies, I'm going to make a change right now. Well, if they make a change right now, you know how this works. The United States, we're a big country, and we, you know, our, our inertia is big. So if we're going down one direction and the new president says, we're going to change directions, well, it takes a while, a while to turn. So... Reagan was actually dealing with some of the inflation, stagflation stuff that Carter was dealing with uh, in Reagan's first two or three years. And so the idea of the trickle down isn't going to come around for three or four or five or six years. Talk to your economics teacher. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. <laughs> Funny cartoons. All right. We got to get rid of the debt. We're going to we're going to we're going to at least keep the debt even. So your two terms, right? Your deficit and your debt. The deficit is how much we're in the hole this year. How much we're in the hole this year. How much more we've spent that we've brought in this year. That's the deficit. The debt is the combination of all of the years added together. So that's how that works. If you look here on the chart from 1940 where it starts our debt so that's the combination of all the years pretty much stayed right there at half half a trillion so 500 billion for quite a bit now look at this we're doing, doing pretty good and then 1975 it went up a little bit and then uh, between 75 and 1980 Carter went up just a little bit then you get to Reagan he was there for two presidential terms from 1980 to 1980 Eight, um, and you see it starts to go up. In fact, we get we basically we basically quadruple our debt up to at that point. Oh no, two trillion dollar debt! A two trillion dollar debt. <laughs> Again, we laugh at that because we just passed a two trillion dollar bill for the you know the the COVID. Goodness. And then you see it just screams out of control uh, after that. Uh, and why, why, why are we jumping that up during Reagan? Well, ironically, the guy who wanted to reduce the debt, he's going to uh, funnel a whole bunch of money into the military for really the reason to stop the Soviet Union. I mean, uh, let's just be honest. He, he's anti-communist. He's going to stop the Soviet Union. How do you do that? You do it by force. And so you can't do that with force if you don't have force. So you put all that money into the military. Here we have a cartoon where uh, Reagan is dancing. And, and you always tell us Reagan because of his hair and or his, his, uh, his, he's old, older. He's, he was the oldest president ever elected up until just recently. And uh, let's see, so he's not dancing with the cities, the, the girl named cities. She's, he's not dancing with the girl named Social Security. He's not dancing with the girl named Environment. He's dancing with the, uh, the, the Department of Defense. Oof. Where did that $2 trillion go? Okay, guys, I'm not even making this up. <laughs> Star Wars. Star Wars. So, what? Star Wars came out, like, like the movie, the original Star Wars Episode Four, A, A New Hope, uh, came out in 1977. That's not what we're talking about when we say Ronald Reagan Star Wars. Okay. So, in 1980, 81... March of 1983. Reagan gets on TV. There he is. There's a shot of, of Reagan getting on TV. I remember this. It makes me pretty old. Um, and he's going to explain his concept of the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Because at this point, we are we're all scared to death that the Soviet Union has these nuclear missiles, these ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that can be shot uh, from anywhere in the world and can hit us at any time of the day, and we're all going to die in a horrible nuclear. Okay, so how do you how do you stop this? Well, you got to have a defense. Well, how do you stop a missile traveling at really fast? And how do you stop that? So here we go. 
<laughs> Hold on to your hats. If we put laser beams, no, I'm sorry, if we put mirrors up in space and we have strong laser beams on the ground, if a nuclear missile from, say, Moscow were to be launched towards, say, Washington, D.C., we would have some time, because we'd know we could detect it by our radars, we'd have some time to shoot it down. How would we shoot it down, you ask? We would shoot a strong laser beam up into space and bounce it off several orbiting satellites, defense satellites that have mirrors, and then that laser would then hit the nuclear weapon rocket and explode it before it got here. I got a picture here in just a second. It's called SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. We're going to shoot down ballistic missiles with laser beams. 1983! And here he is talking about it on TV. And he says, that's why our spending is so much because we got to put up the, you know, the, the, the defense satellites up in the air. Let's see, meanwhile, what's going on in the USSR in 1981? USSR declares martial law in Poland. USSR, the Soviet Union, declared martial law in Poland. I wonder how that worked out. <laughs> Not good for the Polish. In 1983, the United States, I'm sorry, USSR shot down a Korean passenger airline in Soviet airspace. Yeah, that was, that was awful. And in 1983, the Cold War was basically back on. It was back on like, it was back on like Donkey Kong came out in 1981. All right, so a couple of uh, cartoons here. The first one we have, uh, President Reagan is Luke Skywalker, and this guy right here is uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and so he's the leader of the Soviet Union. And this, let's see, 1983, so um, 1983, oh, so let's see, 1980, we already, we already knew that, you know, no, I am your father, the Darth Vader. I hope I didn't give anything away. Down here we <laughs> here we have uh, President Reagan, and he's in the meeting with his Joint Chief of Staff, and he says, um, "As you can see, our newest weapons designer is an expert on fighting the evil empire, and it's Yoda. Fight the evil empire, I will. You know what? That was free. You don't even have to pay for that for that voice impression. That's free." Then you got uh, you got Ronald Reagan here in his bed and with his teddy bear and his sugar plum fairies dancing in his head and all this kind of stuff. And then was he dreaming dreaming about oh the Strategic Defense Initiative satellite? So here we have here we have an example of how it works. Here's the bad guy uh, rocket, the bad guy ICBM missile. It's going to come and kill us all. And then as soon as we detect it with our ground-based radars or our radars up here, um, then we have the laser beam shoots up from wherever it is hidden here in a secret military base. And it shoots up and hits the mirror there and then hits the mirror there and then comes down and blows up the... <laughs> I can't even make that stuff up. Now, I know you're sitting here thinking, well, that's, one, it's kind of cool because, I mean, it's kind of cool. And two, you're like... Do they, is that really up? Is it still up? To, is it, did it, what? It's a great question. Are there giant satellites with mirrors up in space? Or do you think that money went somewhere else? Oh, I'm sure it's fine. You think we were just bluffing the Soviets? Meanwhile, President Reagan in, uh, uh, I remember, okay, so remember he's anti-communist, super anti-communist, and we've got communists coming into Latin America. Remember, we've already had to deal with that crazy down in Cuba, the Fidel Castro, and that didn't work out for us. I mean, he brought in nuclear weapons from, from Khrushchev, and, ah, right, and we had the Cuban Missile Crisis and all that stuff. Well, the communists are going to be moving into Nicaragua and El Salvador and Panama, and, ah, we've got to stop it, we've got to stop it, we've got to stop it. So Reagan is going to, uh, he's going to start pushing troops down there. Now, um, uh, before we do that, let's uh, talk about Lebanon. In uh, 1982, I Israel and Lebanon were not getting along. They're still not really getting along, but they're not getting along. Israel was attacking Lebanon. Lebanon was throwing bombs in Israel. And so Reagan sent a whole bunch of troops, American troops, into Israel to kind of support them. And we had a situation where a Lebanese 
truck pulled up in front of the embassy uh, in front of the uh, what it yeah the embassy the U.S. embassy and boom kind of like the car bomb for uh, Oklahoma City and killed 242 uh, Marines American Marines that did not sit well with the American public and so Reagan pulled the troops out of there. In 1983, we're going to send troops to Grenada, a little bitty island, uh, because Grenada was starting to starting to turn a little Marxist, starting to turn a little communist, and Reagan was going to stop them. Let's see, uh, Reagan threatens, threatens uh, El Salvador that we're going to come down there and smack them around if they don't get their act together with regard to communism. And so he, here is Reagan and his wife, Nancy, Nancy Reagan, and he's holding up the shirt, Stop Communism. Stop Communism, Central America. It's funny because the shirt's red. No, I find that funny. All right. In 1984, we have our next uh, election, and Reagan goes up against a guy by the name of Walter Mondale and his running mate, Geraldine Ferraro. So this is the first time that we have one of our two major political parties where we have a female who's running as vice president, and uh, Reagan just a obliterates Mondale Ferraro. You can see there, um, it says, in the Electoral College, uh, Mondale got 2%, 2% of the vote. Oof, that's, that's got to sting. Uh, I mean, it, that's got to sting. Uh, Mondale won Minnesota, couldn't see it in the map, reverse map, uh, and then uh, Washington, D.C. I told you Washington, D.C. was blue. Though we talked about that the last film. Maybe we did that on Zoom. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. All right, so Mikhail Gorbachev is going to figure hugely in, in uh, uh, Reagan's uh, second presidential term. So Mikhail Gorbachev is the premier of the Soviet Union, uh, the president of the Soviet Union, uh, for want of a better word. And he is going to, uh, he's going to look around and he's going to see things are not working out like they should be. Reagan is spending a bunch of money, just a bunch of money on uh, defense and or offense when it comes to nuclear weapons, just a ton. And Gorbachev sees that his country is not going to be able to keep up. His, the communists are not going to be able to keep up with capitalists. So Gorbachev is going to do a couple things. He's going to introduce two interesting policies. The first one is called Glasnost, and uh, Glasnost is uh, allowing... Uh, it is more of an open, it's called openness, and so the idea that if you were a member of the Soviet Union before Glasnost and you wanted to uh, talk smack about Stalin or Brezhnev or Khrushchev um, and put that in the newspaper, uh, you didn't. Uh, if you did, then uh, uh, you would be disappeared, and so, <laughs> so maybe put it in the Siberian gulags. Uh, but Glasnost opened, opened up so it had a more freedom of expression. So you could talk a little bit of smack <laughs> about Gorbachev. A little bit. Not a, don't go crazy, but uh, the opening up. The other, the other policy that he had was perestroika. So perestroika is the, uh, the idea of, okay, com pure communism, Stalinism, is not working. Maybe we need to open up our country just a little bit uh, for capitalism for capitalism. And so they're going to invite in, that's right, McDonald's. And they're going to they're going to start trying to buy American blue jeans and whoo, crazy things. I knew a person who went over there, bought a plane ticket, went over to Russia, and then uh, had her, had a suitcase full of American blue jeans. She went over there, she then sold the jeans to to the <laughs> probably to the mafia over there, but the Russian mafia, for like a lot of money and then bought a plane ticket and came back and she, she ended up making big money just selling a suitcase full of blue jeans. Crazy times, crazy times. All right, so uh, because Glasnost and Perestroika were in effect and Soviet Union was becoming a little topsy-turvy at that point, uh, they could not stay with us with regard to how much money we were spending on defense. So... Yay! We win! The United States wins the Cold War! I mean, we went into super, super debt. We're still in that debt. I mean, it's like we maxed out all of our credit cards and then all of our other friends' credit cards. But we won the game! 
but I mean, we maxed out all our credit cards. <laughs> Uh, in December 1985, Reagan and Gorbachev were going to sign the INF Treaty, which means that all of the medium-range nuclear weapons, nuclear missiles, excuse me, that are in Europe, we're going to get rid of those. We're going to move them somewhere else. So that way, if the United States has nuclear weapons, say, hypothetically, you know, like in France, which we did, or Berlin, which in West Berlin, maybe, and then, uh, then they would hit the Moscow, and then that would be bad. So we're going to take those out, theoretically. In June of 1987, uh, President Reagan, there he is, sitting in in in, in uh, West Berlin, and he's going to make a he's going to make a speech, and his most famous part of the speech is where he looks basically to the camera and he says, "Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall." He's talking about the Berlin Wall, and two years later, guess what happens? I, I wonder if it's it might be on the slide. We'll see. Okay, and everything's great, and everything's good, and everything's fine, and everything's rocking and rolling, and go USA. And then we hit a we hit a bobble. We hit a bobble. That's more. It's a pretty good sized bobble. All right. So, Lebanon had some American hostages. Nicaragua was starting to go way left, communist. Reagan wanted to send in troops into Lebanon and into Nicaragua. Now remember, the rule was, or uh, well, the Congress said, no, we're not going to let you do that. Oh, my light just went out. That's okay. You don't need to see me. Um, Congress says, you're not going to, uh, you can't do that. Well... Congress says you can't do that. I'm going to keep repeating that until I have a light. Congress says, by the way, you can't do that. So Reagan said, um, okay, well then I'm not going to do that. And he's going to cheat. Well, how do you cheat? How do you cheat? Well, here's how you do it. You take a whole bunch of guns and you give them to Israel. Israel then sells the guns to Iran. And I know you're sitting there thinking, no wait, Iran, they're the bad guys. I know. It's going to get crazier from there. So we give guns to Israel. Israel sells the guns to Iran. Iran, who now has brand new guns, agrees that they'll do this uh, for the cheap guns, as long as they will then negotiate with Lebanon to release the American hostages, which is ironic because it was Iran that had the hostages back in 1979, right? It is what it is. So, Israel guns to Iran, Iran negotiates the release of the hostages. Meanwhile, the money that we made for the guns, which gets back to us, then we use that to fund Contra rebels against the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. So we're hiring guerrilla fighters. We call them the Contras, the, the Contra rebels, the Contras. Um, and we're, we're going to hire them to go against the communist government in Nicaragua. So Reagan basically said, uh, I don't care what you say, Congress, I'm going to go around you and I'm going to do this through this really weird, convoluted way. And it all would have worked out, except uh, somebody let it slip out and suddenly, yeah. So Congress calls, call, calls people in and in to testify. Probably the most famous uh, testimony is right here. This is Colonel Oliver North. He was Colonel at the time. Colonel Oliver Nor North, and uh, he's going to get up there and he's going to put his. Uh, look at him. He's just very military. I mean, he, he looked the perfect soldier, right? And he gets up there and uh, he's going to testify. Now, Reagan also testified, the president testified. Uh, he didn't do it in, in the Congress room, he did it uh, kind of in a small room. But, but uh, his testimony, I, I, can, I can boil it down to just a couple words. I don't remember. He said that, like, I don't know, 20 times. When people people were asking a question, okay, did you authorize uh, us giving guns to Israel to then give them to Iran to then negotiate with? And Reagan would say, I don't remember. 
President of the United States. President of the United States. He, he said that like 20 times. I don't remember. Okay, did we take that money that we got from Iran for selling the Israel guns to the... Did we take that money and did you authorize that money being spent to send the Contras to uh, Nicaragua? And the President of the United States says, I don't remember. Now, he was the oldest president of the United States at that point, so, and interestingly enough, just, was that, not quite 10 years later, uh, I mean, Alzheimer's, and he's going to die of Alzheimer's, but, anyway, back to Ollie North, there's Ollie North, there was Casper Weinberger, no, there's John Poindexter, oh, I did, yeah, Casper Weinberger, there's John Poindexter, and these three guys basically got on the stand, and they all said, no, 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 we didn't tell Reagan about any of this. He was totally not in any of the loop. We did it all ourselves, and so they threw themselves under the bus. And Oliver North, probably the most famous of the guys to do this, and he basically said, no, Reagan, Reagan, was, he, did, he had no knowledge of this. Which we look back at, we, you know, we look back and you think to yourself, you know the president probably knew something about that, right? I mean, you, you, you got to kind of think that. But anyway, Oliver North, and so Ollie North is going to go to jail. Where's my Okay. Here we have a cartoon of President Reagan in his Superman suit, although it's uh, red, white, and blue stars and the stripes. And his cape, and then he comes out of the. He he just turned into a Superman. He comes out of the phone booth, and Central America, see, and the collapse falls on his face. Meanwhile, in the United States of America, we have the moral majority. Uh, Reverend Jerry Falwell is going to. Okay, so Jerry Falwell, he's a Southern Baptist uh, minister. And he's going to be in the news. Let's see. So in the late 70s, was that 78 or 79, um, he was working with uh, Bob Jones University. And they had a clause. In, this is down in Texas. They had a clause that basically said that uh, uh, you couldn't have any interracial dating. If you were a, if you were a student on campus, you couldn't, you couldn't date uh, somebody of a different race. And so when that came out, in, I think, I'm pretty sure the 79, when that came out, then uh, the federal, federal government said, well, we're going to take away your tax, you know, your tax-free status. <laughs> we're, we're not going to give you any tax money uh, because you can't, you can't do that. You can't stop people from, are you kidding me? Right. So Falwell is, is going to be involved in several of those little uh, things. Um, we're going, then he's going to form in 1985-ish. He's going to form a group called the Moral Majority. It's going to become a PAC, a political action committee, which we'll be talking about in government next year. A political action committee, which basically uh, tries to go in and influence how votes work. And so it's called the Moral Majority. And you kind of look here at their platform, and it is preaching against sexual permissiveness. They are anti-abortion, they're anti-feminism, and they are anti-gay rights. So, um, well, that's all I have to say about that. And they're very popular with the fundamentalists. So we're talking about, at that time, the 1985s, we're talking about the, well, for example, the Southern Baptists, um, or, for mem or members of the moral majority. And I'm not saying all Southern Baptists, but, the, but there you go. And so here we have the, uh, some great political cartoons. We have, uh, or one of them here, the teacher from Texas. And uh, he says, his t-shirt says the Texas Education Board. And he says, okay, uh, and social, it says social studies on the kids' book. And he says, okay, open your textbooks to chapter 3, verse 16. And then you note the, the word social studies, the T looks like a Bible see how that works uh, and by the way there is the moral majority and not everybody is a big fan of the moral majority here it says the moral majority is neither the moral majority is neither it's clever that's a clever AIDS is the wrath of God fortunately in the year 2020 and year 2021 we have, we don't have any preachers or anybody who says you know if you get COVID it's because you're 
LBGTQ or you're poor or you're negligent or you're... Fortunately, we don't have any of those people who have said that. And then ironically died of COVID later. It's kind of dark. That was kind of dark. All right, I'm going to erase that. Now, I'm, I'm going to leave it in. All right, moving on. Reagan was a president for eight years. He had two terms, and so he's going to have a couple of uh, uh, justices appointed. He's going to get three of them. He's going to appoint Sandra Day O'Connor. So we're going to finally have a female on the court. Uh, so there's Sandra, uh, there's, there's Sandra Day. I guess that's a picture of her in Time magazine. And there she is walking with the president. And then he's going to, uh, he's going to um, pick, he's going to choose a nominate. I'll, I'll use my big words here in a second. He's going to nominate Antonin Scalia. So that's the one on the very far right who's going to be on the court for like 25 years, and then Justice, Justice Rehnquist. Now, Justice Rehnquist was actually a member of the Supreme Court, but uh, he, was a, he was a junior member, and so, or just a regular member, not the chief. And so then when Chief Justice Berger stepped down, then Justice Rehnquist was then put as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So these are three very, very conservative, very conservative, Antonin Scalia, probably the most, let me think that through. Yeah, probably the most conservative judge ever in the history of the Supreme Court. Also, <laughs> one, of the, one of the smartest out of the 114, uh, 114 Supreme Court justices that we've had, he's probably in the top three. I mean, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he's probably he's pretty bright. And John Marshall, I mean, you can't just say that. But anyway, is that all I have to say about that? We have a, oh, golly, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she's pretty bright too. All right, so Scalia is definitely in the top five. We're going to move on. So now that the court is more conservative, uh, they're going to have some different rulings than, than in the past. And so the liberal court in 1972, Roe versus Wade, you can have an abortion, right? Remember that, the trimester series? And so now we're going to, now we're going to have a different uh, group of judges who are more conservative. And they're going to try to restrict some of Roe. So the first one is Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. That was 1989. The court's going to, the court's going to say states can, can put... Uh, more restrictive uh, burdens on the female. So, for example, uh, I just put a cartoon that says, um, you can have a 24-hour wait. So you can't just walk in, a female can't just walk into the doctor's office and say, I want, uh, I want an abortion now. In some states, they had a 24-hour wait where you say, okay, I want an abortion. The doctor says, great, come back in 24 hours, because that gives you 24 hours to think it all the way through. Other states... Uh, and or states say that another restriction would be you have to tell your spouse. So the, you have to tell the husband, well, I say the husband, but the assumption is the husband, but you have to tell the, the father of the child or the father of the fetus, as the case may be, uh, that you're going to do that. And you have to get their approval. And then another restriction would be if you are under age, say you're under 18, then you have to get your mommy and daddy's approval. So there were some restrictions that were added after Roe v. Wade and that were allowed, those restrictions were allowed. Um, we have Planned Parenthood versus Casey. They're going to change, they're going to change it to as long as the restriction is not an undue burden on the woman, then the state can, uh, can put uh, that on the woman. They've also going to change it and they're going to say the state can put an undue, woman, uh, undue pressure on a, uh, undue burden on a woman in the first trimester. So the Roe versus Wade thing that says first trimester, you can get her, you can get her abortion whenever and however. The second trimester that says the states can put restrictions, and the third trimester the state can say no. Well, now after Casey and after Webster, uh, the rule says that the state can put can put uh, burdens on a female that are not undue, all the way from the beginning, from the first month to the sixth month. Okay. Oh, and also, by the way, Planned, uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, they said that if you, uh, the rule that you have to go ask your, the husband, that is, that is an undue burden and therefore should not be allowed because the conservative court uh, argued, they said, yeah, can't, there, there will be situations where 
That, I mean, that gives the husband a veto power over the female's body, right? And so, I mean, you can, however you want to think about it, because that's the great thing about the United States, you can, you know, you can think about that however you want. But the court said, we shouldn't be giving husbands veto power over the female's decision. So, anyway, that came out of Casey. Uh, affirmative, restri affirmative action. Reagan's going to push back on affirmative action. Remember, affirmative action is uh, allow is trying to uh, basically reparations for uh, non-whites to get jobs or get scholarships um, because of past uh, situations. And so we've already talked about how Bakke versus California said you can't have quotas. You can't say out of 100, we're going to have 16 spots for African Americans. You can't say that, but you can use race as a determining factor. Well, Reagan did not like that. He didn't like having race as a determining factor. And so he, he continued to try to push against that. One of the Supreme Court rulings uh, in 1989 was uh, Ward's Cove Packing versus Antonia and then Martin versus Wilkes, both in 89. And the court said, let's see, so the one in, in uh, and, uh, Ward's Cove Packing was up in Alaska, and so it was a, can a canning, that's what I say canning, that's different, a canning facility where uh, 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 you take the, see, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking uh, uh, beyond my, I'm, I'm over my head here, or under my, uh, under, underwater, you're, uh, you're taking uh, food, food steps and putting them in cans, canning, right? And so um, that doesn't require a lot of specialized knowledge, but there are some parts of that process that does. And so there were non-whites, and we're, we're talking specifically about Inuits and Eskimos, uh, who complained and said, we aren't getting the good jobs, we're only getting the non-good jobs. And so we want the good jobs. And this company is being racist with regard to its hiring practices. And so affirmative action, right? And the court said, okay, here's the deal. If you say the R word, if you say racist, you have to prove it. You have to prove that the company is being racist. And so for this particular scenario, you look at, okay, for the specialized production, how many whites versus non-whites in this area of Alaska have the credentials to then do that special production. And if you can prove that the percentages of versus the percentages of, then it's not racism. So that was a victory for Reagan and the, and the conservatives with regard to uh, against affirmative action. I think, I have a, I think that's all I have to say about that. Oh, hey, it's, it's sad, but it's a funny, it's funny. Uh, back to the abortion, the undue burden. We instituted a simple nine-month waiting period. I want an abortion. Okay, you have to wait nine months. Let's see what? In 1986, I was down in the old middle, the old middle school. It was junior high at that time. Down in the basement, I was taking an Oklahoma history test. We had to do all 77 counties. I remember this because my my friend who was sitting in front of me had a map of the Oklahoma counties on the floor and he was looking over and he was writing the names of the counties in on his test. I was not looking at the map on the floor because I know my 77 counties. The reason I remember this so vividly is because I was most of the way through the map when the intercom went off and the principal said to us, yes, we are aware of the situation that is going on right now. Um, what we know right now is that the Space Shuttle Challenger um, blew up and all lives were lost. And we'll get more information to you as quick as possible. And that was all, that's all we knew. And so, when we went home that evening, of course, it was on the news, the special challenger, 73 seconds, 73 seconds into liftoff, um, and there it is, there's lifting off, 73 seconds, it came apart, and all the astronaut lives were lost. 
this was our, f now we had had astronauts die. We had had astronauts die, but we had never had seven die in a catastrophe like this before. So it was just devastating, devastating. It was, it was really devastating to me because at that point I, I, I was actually thinking down the road, hmm, astronaut. It was, it was just devastating. Um, what made it even more awful was that Krista McAuliffe, Krista McAuliffe, she, uh, she was a teacher. She was not an astronaut per se. She was a teacher. She had kind of gone through, she had, got won, she had won a contest. I say that contest. She had won a, a, a lottery and then she, she trained as an astronaut to go up into space. And the entire time she was training for that year, she, she basically had a YouTube channel, although YouTube didn't exist, but you know what I'm saying. She had her own, she had her own uh, PBS stuff and she would film what it was like to be an astronaut and, and, how, and how it all worked. And the plan was that she'd go up in space and she'd do a couple of, a couple of lessons from space. So everybody was very excited because it was the first teacher in space and it was going to be great. And then um, because a teacher was involved, schools all over the country, all over the country, they had their kids, like the elementary kids in, in their gyms and they're all watching on the big screen TVs back then. And so, I mean, we're talking about millions of kids watching the liftoff, right? Millions of kids and cheering for, I'm starting, to, <laughs> I'm starting to cheer up a little bit, uh, and because um, I remember, uh, and so millions of these kids and they're cheering for her and go Miss McAuliffe and then, boom. So that was a bad day. That was a bad day. Okay. That evening, President Reagan was supposed to give his State of the Union speech, and so he scrapped the speech, and he said uh, he gave a, a short eulogy, a speech written by his speechwriter, Peggy Noonan. She's interesting. You should look her up. <laughs> um, if, if, my, if my dad is watching this right now, he's like, oh, Peggy Noonan. Uh, she's a little crazy. Anyway, so uh, 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 President Reagan's going to give a speech, and... Um, I re there, there he is on the TV, there's a, a, ca a screen capture of the TV. He says down here, the future does not belong to the faint-hearted, it belongs to the brave. The last, one of the last things he said in his speech, which, man, it really chokes me up, but I'm going to get through it, watch this. He says, uh, this was quoted from a poem by John Gillespie McGee Jr. He says, quote, we will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Oof. That was a rough day. As Reagan's about to go out of office, <laughs> I know, it's he, in 1987, so he's still got a year and a half here, here but we had Black Monday, we're going to have a huge drop in the stock market. Oof. 508 points, which was really a big deal, but and you're thinking, well, that's, that's even more than what we had before, right? And then, oh, oh yeah, but percentage-wise, percentage-wise, it wasn't as big as the Great Depression, the, the you know, Black Thursday, Black Friday. Uh, Republicans, voters, all right, so we are going to have the second vote, or we're going to have the next presidential election, and Vice President George Bush, number one, is going to run for president because Reagan can't run again. And so he's going to run against, who do we have? Oh, right, Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis. And so the red are the Republicans and the blue are the Democrats. And you can see landslide by the Republicans. Except for, I mean, but California even voted for, oh, but California, Reagan, Hollywood actor. You see how that works? Um, okay. We're on number 41. We only have to get to number 45. Really, just number 44. Look at this. We're almost there. George Herbert Walker Bush. Okay, so when you think about people who have credentials on their resumes, and you guys are working on your high school resumes, right? I mean, you're like, you're like actually designing them, right? Because you might be asked in the near future. So if you look at people who, and their resumes, I mean, I, okay, George Washington's resume, right? I mean, he, he was 
commander-in-chief of the Revolutionary Army, and he was the president of the Constitutional Convention. Okay. Um, Thomas Jefferson, I mean, you know, scientist, philosopher, I mean, I, okay, sure. Um, Andrew Jackson, uh, general, and we, and we can do that with a lot of people. Um, president Reagan was a Hollywood actor. Uh, he was governor of California. Um, and you get to this guy. And look at look at his resume. Man, I wish I had a resume like this. I mean, watch this. Wait, his resume. First of all, he was the youngest <laughs> the youngest pilot in the Navy. Uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, you think, okay, how long was that? Well, that wouldn't, okay, right, so Pearl Harbor happened. He was younger than uh, he should have been, and he told the people that he was actually older than he was, and he, be he became a fighter pilot. All right, so one, fighter pilot. Number two, he served as ambassador to the United Nations, so he represented the country in the United Nations under President Nixon. He served as chief ambassador to China under President Ford. Okay, so China, that seems like that's important. He served as the director of the CIA, right? The Central Intelligence Agency. So he was our chief spook, our chief spy for eight years. Okay, that seems like that's good. He was vice president under Reagan for eight years. So, I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty good resume. Pretty good resume. Uh, let's see, his presidency was dominated by foreign affairs. One of the first things he did was he's going to pardon everybody involved in the Iran Contra affair. Is this the first time a president has pardoned people? No. Remember, Ford pardoned Nixon for any and all things that he may or may not have done. And then we had President Carter, who pardoned all the draft dodgers. And so here, President Bush pardons Oliver North and Casper Weinberger and John Poindexter and President Reagan. <laughs> Although he doesn't actually name President Reagan. Uh, for anybody who's involved in the Iran-Contra affair, great. As a as a presidential candidate, <laughs> he, he had a... He had, uh, so, uh, he had, a, he had a campaign promise. He's, read my lips, no new taxes. That actually wasn't that bad. Read my lips, no new taxes. And so everybody ran, uh, so he ran on this thing. That, I'm not going to raise taxes like anybody else says. I'm not going to raise taxes. And for three years, he didn't raise taxes. And uh, then he had to raise taxes. And no. Oh, well, actually, it's actually Congress to raise taxes. He just signed it. And I wonder if the Democrats are going to jump on that later. <laughs> so what's going on during President Bush? Well, we've got, so let's see this, 1989. What happened in 1989? Oh, Tiananmen Square. Well, first of all, I graduated from Western Heights. Tiananmen Square. Uh, so feel free to jump on the communist, I'm sorry, on the, the PRC, the People's Republic of China. Uh, jump on their Google and search Tiananmen Square. <laughs> eh, I laugh. Uh, so you had Mr. Tank Guy and all that kind of stuff. We've talked about that before. All right, number, uh, what else? Communism was falling apart in 1989. We had Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, East Germany, Romania. They're all, everything's coming apart. And December of 1989, well, actually a little before that, right? Uh, the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall is going to, they're going to start taking... Do I have a picture of that? Oh, yeah, I've got a guy up here with a hammer, with a sledgehammer, and he's just going to town on the Berlin Wall. Uh, in August of 1991, there's a military coup that tries to get rid of Gorbachev. Gorbachev sees it coming. He's like, all right, I'm out. So he's going to actually come over to the United States. But um, we have Lithuania is the first of the SSR countries, Soviet, the Soviet uh, republics, to break away from the Soviet Union. As soon as Lithuania breaks away, then you've got Estonia and Latvia. Uh, they break away soon after that so the baltics are gone so we have 15 states now we're down to 12 and then the ukraine and belarus and kurdistan and <laughs> i was about to name them all kakistan and uzbekistan and russia and uh, georgia and armenia and azerbaijan and uh, what am i forgetting did i say belarus maybe didn't matter. But they all, it all came apart. It all came apart. And uh, Boris Yeltsin is going to become the president of Russia. Do I have him up there? No, I don't. Boris Yeltsin is going to become the president of Russia. It's no longer the Soviet Union. It's now Russia. And all the other stands are going to become independent countries. In 1991, Chechnya attempts to secede from Russia, and Yeltsin sends in troops to smash them. And the United States is like, well, you, well, you can't do that. In 1990, South America releases in South America. Uh, 
why do I have South America? That, that should say South Africa. That's embarrassing. South Africa releases Nelson Mandela, who had been in jail for 30 years, and he's going to become the president of South Africa. We're going to get rid of the apartheid government, which we talked about last year in world history. In 1990, 1990, Nicaragua holds elections and the Sandinistas lose. Remember the Contras and the Sandinistas. And then 1992, Civil War in El Salvador and the Democratics, the Democratic Republicans kind of win that one. All right. Right. So since we won the war, the Cold War, right? We won the Cold War, although we're in debt, right? Because we can't pay back our credit cards. But uh, where are we, we have... Where are we going to spend all this money? Because, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, the Marines, what do you call that? The military, thank you. The military is used to all this money coming in. So where are we going to spend? What are we going to spend them on? Spend that? I mean, we already have floating space stations, laser beams in space. What are we going to do? At the very beginning, I didn't talk about this, but there's a little picture down here in the lower right corner of Reagan at the very beginning, like his second slide said something like, Re Reagan, I'm paraphrasing, he says, look, we don't tax, oh, no, 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 he says, how, and I'm paraphrasing here, it doesn't matter how much you tax people for, for that tax money to go to the government, the government will find a way to spend the money. So Reagan's, Reagan says, the more we tax, the more the government's going to spend, because they'll always spend the money that we give them. So how about this? Let's just give them less money, and then they won't spend as much. Well, that was all good until he started spending $2 trillion on space stations in space, which makes sense because I call them space stations. Getting close to the end here, and I just kind of a, kind of a funny, ha <laughs> ha uh, ha. George Bush, number one, uh, number 41, president, uh, his vice president, uh, Dan Quayle. Vice President Quayle, he's fun, he's fun. He, he would, he would, uh, he talked a lot without thinking it through. <laughs> He'd start a sentence and not think it all the way through before, before he got to the end. Here are some of my favorite Dan Quayle-isms. Um, and if you, if you go to Google and you type in Dan Quayle isms or Dan Quayle quotes, uh, there's lots of these and they're just, they're fun. So here are a couple of them, just kind of funny. Ha ha. Here we go. Uh, we'll just start the, the far, probably the most famous one is up here is upon seeing a 12 year old's correct spelling of the word potato. So he was like in this third grade class, second grade class, and a little girl spelled potato, P-O-T-A-T-O, -T -O, up on the board, right? And he said... Oh, honey, that's fine phonetically, but you're missing a little bit. And he walked up there and he put an E at the end of potato. He did that. <laughs> he did that in front of national cameras. Yeah, I misspelled the word potato. It's fine. It's just the vice president. It's not like you have to spell it to the vice president. I was recently on tour of Latin America, and the only regret I have was that I didn't study Latin harder in school so I could converse with these people. Because, you know, all the people in Latin America, they speak Latin. I love California. I practically grew up in Phoenix. <laughs> I have made good judgments in the past. I have made good judgments in the future. I believe we are on an irreversible trend towards more freedom and democracy. But that could change. It's wonderful to be here in the great state of Chicago. One word sums up probably the responsibility of any vice president, and that one word is to be prepared. Can't even make this stuff up. <laughs> it's great. Somebody should make, somebody should do a play. Somebody should do a play and just use quailisms. Uh, this is a Tim Robbins. He's a, he's a, a Hollywood actor and uh, <laughs> Uh, he, uh, uh, anyway, he, he, write, he says this. There's no question that Dan Quayle is an uneducated idiot. But someone, somewhere, cleverly realized that the best diversion from Bush is to put on the clown show. <laughs> it's funny. Two more slides and we're done. Two more slides. 
August of 2001. We've talked about this last year. In August of 2000, I think we did. I don't know, COVID. We may not have. August, oh, I don't think we did. It doesn't matter. Okay, stop. Just talk about it. August of 2001, Saddam Hussein, president slash dictator of Iraq, claims that Kuwait, next door neighbor Kuwait, is slant drilling. So they're taking their oil rigs and the they're drilling sideways down into Iraq. So right there on the line, and so they're drilling into Iraq's oil. And so Saddam Hussein says, mm, nope, that's a violation of everything. And so Saddam Hussein uh, uh, goes into Kuwait and uh, takes over Kuwait. The United Nations says, Saddam Hussein, you can't do that, and we're going to ask you to please leave. And so they passed resolution 665 and 666 and 667 and 668, not 8, and 669, and basically says, Saddam Hussein, get out of Kuwait. George Bush, President George Bush, remember, he was the head delegate of the United States in the United Nations back under Ford, or before, whenever that was. And so... He he uses he's going to use the United Nations. He's going to he's going to have the Security Council just come on, Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein says no, and so the Security Council says, look, January fifteenth, January fifteenth, you better be out of Kuwait. January fifteenth, you better be out of Kuwait. I remember this well because I was at the University of Tulsa and I was thinking, huh, if we go to war, I'm the perfect age to be drafted. That's not cool. So uh, January 15th came, and here comes midnight, and no Kuwait. Kuwait is still captured by Iraq. And so the very not <laughs> long after that, like just a couple hours, we commence with a program called Shock and Awe. Shock and Awe, where we took 37 days. Yep. 37 days, starting on January 16th, we dropped bombs on Saddam Hussein for 37 days straight. Like 24 hours, 24-7. 37 days straight. Boom. Boom. Like one at like every five seconds for 37 days straight. Shock and awe. There's just a picture of part of it. And I remember sitting in my uh, sitting in my dorm with my friends there that were all about the same age, and we're watching this on TV, going, oh, "Get him! Get him! Get him!" Because we're all we're all old enough to be drafted, right? Get him! It's Thirty-seven days of shock and awe. Well, after that, we had General Norman Schwarzkopf come in, and he uh, he removed the Iraqi troops from Kuwait. Uh, the vast majority of the Iraqi troops, when they saw the Americans coming, they basically went, uh, okay. That's true. They, they actually gave up. Okay. And then they left. So, and how, uh, and then uh, one of my favorite stories about that is, okay, do you have time? Yeah, you do. So, this is 30 seconds. So, um, one of the reporters asked General Shupskov afterwards at the press conference, wow, where did you come up with the game plan on how you beat the Iraqis, how, that you did it so fast? How did you, where did you come up with the game plan? And Shortskov reaches into his front pocket and he pulls out a copy of The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And he says, right there, everything I know came out of that book right there, Sun Tzu. 2,200-year-old Chinese general. We've talked about this last, last year. Sun Tzu. And then the reporter's like, but, but everybody knows about that book. And Schwarzkopf is like, apparently not everybody. Awkward. So what, what should we learn from this? You should listen to your world history teacher. And for that matter, your American history teacher. All right. Um... So Schwarzkopf did exactly what MacArthur didn't. Remember, the Korean War, MacArthur was told, go up to the line and stop, and MacArthur didn't. He went all the way up to the next line, and the Chinese invaded, and that was bad. Schwarzkopf was told, kick the Iraqi out of Kuwait. So he kicked them out of Kuwait, and we easily, so easily, could have advanced into Baghdad and captured Saddam Hussein. But George Bush said, no, 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 we're just going to... All I want you to do is kick them out of Kuwait. Hindsight, right? We should have, we should have 
gotten him. But his son's going to, uh, we'll get there. Last slide. Last slide for the day. The home front, okay, 1990 with the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, and uh, so this is going to be passed. 14th minute, right? E equality, equality. So if you're in a wheelchair, yeah, equality. So we're going to start building ramps everywhere. In the 19, well, 1989, when I graduated, there were no ramps on the uh, in the uh, football on the football stadium, and so then about let's see that was the year 2001 2002 they finally 10 years after the ADA uh, they uh, they started putting ramps in. Uh, if you go to if you're in this hallway in uh, the math hallway here at the high school and you're in a wheelchair trying to get into the bathrooms, think about. Think about the in, the egress and the ingress, the, the doors. They're not that. You know, I mean, they're not super wide. And plus, trying trying to get people through there. Now, think about the middle school, getting into the bathrooms. Think about how that works, or for that matter, Bridgestone. If you came from Bridgestone too, think about how wide it is. If you want to go, if you want to go to the left, go to the right. Whether you're in any or out, it doesn't matter. But but it's a very wide, and the stalls are very wide, so you can get a wheelchair in there. Um, here in the math hall, which was built in 1972, um, it's not very wheelchair friendly. So we have other restrooms in this building that are that were reconstructed. Um, in fact, just last year, the bathrooms down there by the cafeteria, we had brand new bathrooms. What well, did you see? What they did? They made them a little wider, and said, "There you go." ADA. We had a situation. Uh, Three years ago, where uh, I had a girl who was in a wheelchair on the stage, she was in she was in one of my plays, and we didn't have a way to get her on the stage except she had to go outside by the band room and go around into that back door, and then she could come onto the stage. Well, that's not fair to her because she's in a wheelchair. That's not fair that she has to go outside, especially that one night that we were practicing and it was raining. That's just not fair. And so, guess what they have now? They have that little ramp or that little uh, wheelchair elevator on the right side of the stage that goes right up those little bit stairs. And so, ADA. All right. That's all I have to say about that. All right. 1992, the Water Project Bill. 1991, Bush nominates Clarence Thomas. Uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall is going to retire from the court. And so, Clarence Thomas is going to uh, take his spot. And so, uh, Clarence Thomas, who is going to be really good friends with Antonin Scalia. The two of them are going to be very, very, very conservative. And here we are in the year 2020, and Clarence Thomas is still on the court. I mean, he's, still, he's still ticking. Man, that's, that's, that's a long time down the court. Uh, oh, yeah. Interesting story if you want to look up OU law professor Anita Hill. There we are, OU again. And talking about discrimination and or other crazy stuff with regard to that. 1992, unemployment rate was 7%. Oof. 1992, also Bush's, the Bush's Department of Education challenges, this is kind of interesting, the challenges uh, the legality of college scholarships that were offered only to minorities. So, for example, um, hey, here's the XYZ scholarship, but you can't apply unless you are a Latina. Here is scholarship A, B, C, and you can't apply unless you're a female African American. Uh, President Bush said, uh, "I don't think that. I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do that." Well, that was overruled, by the way, and you you can do that. So, if you are a female African American, there are scholarships open that others, uh, other uh, people who are not female and not African American, they can't get. Go look for those. If you're if you are a, a member of a minority of, in any way, female. It's kind of weird how it works out. Uh, female and or uh, race and or ethnicity and or low GPA. Maybe you have a low GPA, just forget it. You know, like you know, you you fail a concurrent course or something like that. That'd be awkward. All right, hey everybody. Well, don't not like fail. What well, maybe even just get a B in a concurrent course. Uh, concurrent course. Yeah, your life's pretty much over at that point. Okay, everybody. That was the 1980s and the early 1990s. We only have one more video after this to wrap up the whole thing.
and we'll get to the, all the other presidents. Oh man, it's almost over. Be good.